Welcome to the Wednesday Honors Luncheon Series. Featuring Professor Mario Kessler. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Gallancy, Assistant Director of the uh, Honors Program. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, our speaker this evening is uh, Professor, Professor Mario Kessler, whose specialty is the history of modern Germany. Uh, he teaches at the University of Potsdam. Uh, he's going to make some comments this evening on the 75th anniversary of uh, Kristallnacht. And uh, we're happy to have you back again. I Thank think you. this is your second time around here at YU? The fourth time. Fourth time, excuse me. I'm a veteran. <laughs> anyway, mm -hmm. uh, welcome and mm -hmm. it's really nice to have you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Thank you very much uh, for uh, coming. I have to specify the title. I was asked to uh, give a talk on the Kristallnacht, the pogrom night, in uh, Eastern German history and memory. Uh, this is uh, since I grew up in Eastern Germany, the German Democratic uh, Republic, and uh, I should uh, and, and I was asked to confine a, br a, a very broad subject to, let's say, to this uh, more specific part of the story and that's what I will do. Yeah? The 9th of November, as you know, uh, or, or as uh, some of them you may know, that is, it is a multifaceted date in German um, history. On this date in 1849, the radical democratic revolutionary Robert Blum was executed in Vienna. On the 9th of November 1918, the German Emperor William II abdicated during the revolution that led to the Democratic Weimar Republic. And on the 9th of November 1923, Hitler's first attempt to power by a coup d'etat failed in Munich. The 9th of November 1989 was the day when the Berlin Wall fell. The 9th of November 1938 was above all other events the Knights of Broken Class, or Kristallnacht. On this and on the following days, around 400 Jews were killed in Germany and Austria. Around 30,000 were incarcerated and brought to jails or concentration camps. Over 1,000 synagogues were burned and around 70,000 Jewish businesses were destroyed. And here I will focusing on only two aspects of the Pogromnacht the pogrom night, as it is mostly called today in Germany. I will concentrate on articles from East German's principal newspapers Neues Deutschland, and also on some studies of East German historians. I must leave aside the confrontation with the Holocaust in film and television, although the commemoration of the pogrom night is bound with East German TV programs such as Die Nacht der Pogrome or Als die Synagogen brannten, and also with memories such as Professor Mamlock or Jacob the Liar. Neither commemorations in museums and fictional literature, nor school or university textbooks can we discuss here. I also must omit another topic, East Germany's relations or non-relations <coughs> with Israel. The reflections of the pogrom night in Neues Deutschland was necessarily an elite central discourse, but I hope to outweigh, the, outweigh this perspective by including some voices of the victims which became in the end a part of the general politics of memory. Let me start with some remarks on the politics of memory in Soviet modeled East Germany. It is not possible to, to discuss this issue without a brief reference to the political conditions under which East Germany or the GDR, the German Democratic Republic, existed. East German's politics of history and memory was shaped by the general conditions under which Soviet-style communist order was established. But the GDR, a country of 17, 17 million inhabitants, was unique in having more than 300,000 Soviet soldiers stationed on its soil. It was also unique in representing the front line of the Cold War. Its historians and journalists had to deal with the fact that right next to them their West German competitors <coughs> attempted to influence East German population through electronic medias that could be received in most parts of the GDR. It was clear to the Soviet occupying powers from the outset 
that if their military administration in Eastern Germany were to be replaced by a German government, a Soviet-style unified fight Labour Party was a prerequisite. In April 1946, the KPD, the Communist Party of Germany, and the East German Social Democratic uh, Party, the SPD, formed the Socialist Unity Party, or SED, which was to become East Germany's uncontested ruling political body. But right after its formation, leading Soviet-trained communists attributed to the party still a mixed character. The pressure to cleanse the party of dissenters in no way matched the potential threat posed by former Social Democrats. Furthermore, the Soviets and their German allies were well aware of another potential groups for resistance, namely that of SED members who had belonged before 1933 to leftist socialist and anti-Stalinist communist groups such as the Socialist Workers' Party of Germany, the SAPD, the KPD opposition, the KPO, the Trotskyists and the Leninbund. Those members of the small leftist workers' organizations who had survived the Nazi regime were active in forming local anti-fascist action committees in a number of German cities and towns, even before Russian or Western armies liberated these places. The English and American troops simply dissolved these committees. The Russians moved more cautiously and, play and placed Moscow-trained communists at the top of these committees before dissolving them. But Walter Ulbricht, the German communist leader who was closest to Moscow, soon ordered the dissolution of these spontaneously formed bodies. Most of the committee's activists joined the KPD, if only to raise their critical voices. Numerous committee members and other anti-fascists had emerged from underground work or were liberated from Nazi camps and jails. They frequently attributed much responsibility for the crimes of Nazism of the Ger German people, since they had experienced isolation in their unequal struggle against the Nazi regime. Leading communist politicians who mostly returned from Soviet exile had to take this into account. Thus, the declaration of the KPD on the 11th of June 1945 emphasized that in every German the awareness and guilt must burn that the German people bear a significant responsibility for the war and its consequences. It was not just Hitler who was responsible for these crimes against humanity. Partially responsible are also those 10 million Germans who freely voted for Hitler in 1932. Even so, we communists want, whoever votes for Hitler votes for war. With this declaration of the KPD, it did not exclude the genocide against Jews. It did not mention it in any particular way either. This was in accordance with the Soviet line of viewing the Holocaust as only secondary to the Nazi regime. Yet, during the first post-war years, there was serious consideration <coughs> of offering surviving Jews not only individuals, the individual, but also collective compensation. There was also some criticism of this proposal from within the communists. In one of its first meetings, the Berlin Governing, the Berlin Governing Council of the Organizations of Victim of Fascism, the ODF, <coughs> announced its interest in limiting the range of people who would be entitled to compensation. Victims of fascism, the communist Deutsche Volkszeitung argued, are those Jews who were persecuted and killed because of Nazi racial delusions, are those Jehovah's Witnesses as well as the so-called Arbeitsvertragssünder, people who broke labor contracts. But we cannot extend the range of victims of fascism so far. They all suffered much but they did not fight the Nazis actively. However, after some debate within the KPD and the victims of fascism organization, it was decided to include the racially persecuted in the category of, of victims of fascism. Since 1945, it was the 1st of September, the beginning of the Second World War, and not the 9th of November, that was central for the politics of memory in East Germany. Thus. The second Sunday in September was commemorated as the days of the victims of fascism. Let me come to the partial displacement of memory. 
As a consequence of, the, of this policy, the first anniversary ceremonies of the pogrom night, the Kristallnacht, in 1945-47 uh, took place in the small circles of Jewish communities, although representatives of the victims of fascism, the ODF, and even the deputy chairman of the SED, Otto Grotewohl, you have the names on the list, joined them. In a letter for party functionary training, the SED explained that racial hatred was especially directed against Jews and Slavic peoples. On the ninth anniversary, Neues Deutschland focused mainly on the economic dimension of the Nazi atrocities against the Jews and on the affinity between capitalist big business and the Nazi elite. The newspaper mentioned, on the other hand, the guilt of the majority of the German population who had in one way or the other profited from the expropriation and expulsion of the Jews. One year later, on the eve of the 10th anniversary, in 1948, two significant though small books were published in East Germany that commemorated the pogrom night as a consequence of the history of anti-Semitism, Stefan Heimann's Marxism and the Racial Question and Siegbert Kahn's Marxism and Race Baiting. A year earlier, Victor Klemperer's book, LTI, a philologist's notebook, was published. During the year 1947, desecrations of Jewish cemeteries had been registered in all four German zones of occupation. Neues Deutschland, as well as other newspapers, warned on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the Pogrom Night in 1948 of a resurgence of anti-Semitism. Paul Merkor wrote in the leading SED newspaper that Nazi anti-Semitism was a tool to divert the masses from their own repression by the Nazis. Numerous com commemorative events by the Jewish communities, the victims of fascism organization, and the churches followed this line. Walter Bartel, a Buchenwald camp survivor, said in a speech at Deutsches Theater in Berlin that the pogrom night could only happen because German workers failed in 1918 to break the rule of the generals Thyssen and Krupp. At this time, in 1948, almost 13, 13, thousand persons had been convicted for their participation in Nazi crimes in East Germany, while in the western zones with a three times larger population only 6,400 were arrested for that reason. However, at the same time, Soviet policy took an anti-Israeli and essentially anti-Jewish turn away from former support of the victims of fascism. The GDR policy towards the small East German Jewish population was largely determined by the Soviet Union. Repressive Stalinist measures towards the Jews, as carried out in the Soviet Union beginning in 1949, were extended in a considerably milder form to the GDR in 1952-53. Stalinist anti-Semitic policies ended, ended an initial phase in the GDR that was characterized by active engagement for the Jews. The anti-Semitic campaign initiated by the Soviet leadership put a stop to this process. At the end of 1952, the Staatssicherheit, or Stasi, East Germany Secret Service, searched Jewish communities' offices and confiscated files. As a result, five of eight leaders of the Jewish community and more than 400 community members fled to the West. SED leaders nevertheless refused to stop financial aid to the religious communities, although the Stasi suspected them of being agents of class enemies. Following Moscow's policy, the SED even adopted for a brief period the anti-Semitic rhetoric in its newspaper's reports about the Prague Slansky trial, which simultaneously, while simultaneously suppressing individual outbursts of anti-Semitism on the street. This campaign against so-called cosmopolitanism affected Jewish, but also non-Jewish, re-emigrants re from the West such as Paul Merkel, much more than other parts of the population. Like no other East German politician, Merkel had been an advocate of full-scale material compensation for the Jews, inside and outside the GDR. This position was now branded as pro-imperialist and pro-Zionist. Merkel's political career ended in August 1950, when he was expelled from the Politburo of the SED due to absurd espionage accusations. From 1952 until 56, he was put in jail and largely, and later only half-heartedly, rehabilitated. 
he never regained any political influence. It is not surprising that during the next years the November pogrom, the Kristallnacht was less mentioned in Neues Deutschland than the anniversary of the 1918 November Revolution that led to the establishment of the Weimar Republic and also to the founding of the Communist Party of Germany. The last event was, event was particularly celebrated. <coughs> On the initiative of Rector Heinrich Grüber, a respected anti-fascist, the Protestant Church paid attention to the anniversary and reflected the Church's passivity vis-à-vis -vis its members of Jewish descent during the Nazi regime. But the articles in Neues Deutschland that addressed the pogrom night stressed more the East German anti-fascist narrative than the sufferings of the Jews. <coughs> East Germany's memory culture needed active communist resistance fighters more than perceived Jewish victims. Any critical view on the rule of bystanders had disappeared. Jewish resistance to the Nazis was not mentioned. This does not mean that the new stage of anti-Semitism as it was manifested at the pogrom night was neglected. Neglected. It was, however, not Neues Deutschland, but several local newspapers that gave detailed reports about the pogrom, um, and, um, namely in Berlin. A week after the anniversary, on the 16th of November 1953, Neues Deutschland mentioned briefly a commemoration of the Jewish community of East German and the association of the persecuted of the Nazi regime. To avoid, from its own anti-Jewish measures, the East German press attacked frequently frequently West Germany, where indeed a much greater number of former Nazis lived than in the East and where law often prevented them from being persecuted. During the following years, Neues Deutschland mentioned almost every single right-wing activities against the commemoration of the pogrom night in West Germany and West Berlin. The newspaper also claimed, claimed not always incorrectly, that such activities were tolerated while anti Nazi protests were often branded and repressed as communist subversion. In 1958, on the eve of the 20th anniversary, the GDR opened on the place of the former Buchenwald concentration camp, a large memorial complex. The concentration of the anti-fascist resistance, and namely on the part of the communists in it, caused the concern of the sub-department for church affairs in the Ministry for Internal Affairs particularly because this anniversary was for the first time widely acknowledged as a day of commemoration in West Germany. The writer Arnold Zweig published then a recollection of diaries from Holocaust victims. A year later, Neues Deutschland gave under the headline in the DDR, GDR the ideas of the November are victorious a full account of the, of the how the legacy of the November Revolution was fulfilled in East Germany but referred only in brief to the commemoration of the pogroms. In 1960, the year in which Adolf Eichmann was arrested and brought to court in Israel, the GDR press focused on the appointment of West German Deputy Minister Hans Globke, who had in 1935 co-authored the <coughs> official commentary to the Nazi law that revoked the citizen of the German Jews, the infamous Nuremberg Laws. Since the early 1960s, other anniversaries that were connected with the Nazi past were intensely commemorated at the expense of the 9th of November, such as the 30th of January, the day on which Hitler had become German Chancellor, and the 20th of July, the day of the defeated the plot by Count Stauffenberg and his circle to assassinate Hitler. But the year 1936 saw a series of meetings where state officials and representatives of the small Jewish communities jointly commemorated the 25th anniversary of the pogrom night. In the same year, East Germany's Protestant churches participated for the first time in the state-run activities of commemoration. During this ti time, historical research on the Holocaust, or it, as it was called in the GDR, the extermination of the Jews, die Vernichtung der Juden, developed. Until the mid-1950s, a considerable number of historical studies that were published or distributed in the GDR were translations from um, Polish or Czech, such as Bernard Marx's standard work on the Warsaw Ghetto, Up Ghetto Uprising, or Ota Kraus, Erich Kolkas and Adolf Rudnitzky's works on Auschwitz. Since 1956, the GDR published documentations on the Nuremberg trials and the SS, 
that dealt at length with the extermination against the Jews. Among many other works, Friedrich Karl Kaul, a prominent lawyer and himself a Holocaust survivor, published in 1965 a book on Herschel Grünspan. Helmut Eschwiger's work, Kennzeichen J, the J sign, that dealt largely with the extermination of the Jews, could be published only after years of internal discussion, since the Holocaust was in this book not primarily interpreted as an outcome of the class interests of the capitalists or big business, but as a result of social dynamism, dynamism of the Nazi regime. This interpretation came close to what was later called in the West a functionalist approach, that rivalry within the Nazi power structures provided the major driving force behind the Holocaust. <coughs> Günter Paulus, a historian who advocated a similar approach, was forced to leave the Academy Institute of History, since he had explicitly challenged the official position according to which fascism was a poorly instrument of monopoly capitalism and the plan to exterminate the Jews was primarily directed by the aim to improve the system of rule and exploitation of Germany and the occupied territories. A collective work on the extermination of the Jews that came out in 1973 strictly, strictly followed the orthodox interpretation of the parties. One must, of course, take into account the small material and personal resources of East German historical scholarship. Giving the limits, a number of scholarly books was published, to name but a few, Wolfgang Heiser's work on the intellectual origins of German nationalism and anti-Semitism, Kurt Petzold's books, you have all the names in the list, on the beginning of anti-Jewish persecution after 1933, and Joachim Petzold's study on the forerunners of Nazi ideology met scholarly standards. <coughs> These books interpreted Nazi anti-Semitism as the extreme form of general racism that was also directed against Slavs, Roma and other people. Historical research was and remained under party control, but there was no state or party directive that obliged historians to choose their specific topic of research. The 30th anniversary of the Kristallnacht saw in 1968 a series of commemoration in both German states, 22 in the East and at least 75 in the West. The central commemoration in East Germany was not held in East Berlin, but in Dresden. Representatives of the state, but also of East German Jewish communities, emphasized that the GDR was the only true homeland for its, its Jewish citizens. These statements must be seen within the context that a year before the GDR had, during the Six Days War, condemned the imperialist Israeli aggression against the Arab states and accused the United States and West Germany of being accomplices with the aggressor. The number of publications about extermination of the Jews increased on the eve of the anniversary. On the 9th of November 1978, Kurt Petzold wrote in Neues Deutschland that the pogrom night had prepared German population for the boundless slaughter of war. At the same time, the GDR, <coughs> the Academy of Sciences, started the multi-volume research project Europe under the swastika that dealt with not only the Nazi occupation policy but also the collaboration of Germans and non-Germans with the perpetrators. Um, let me come uh, to the end and let me say a few words about a more nuanced interpretation and its limits. Before the 50th anniversary in 1988 the Neue Synagoge in Berlin was restored and reopened and was also selected as the site of Centrum Judaicum, a cultural center. East German authorities, such as the party and state leader Erich Honecker and Oskar Fischer, the Minister for, for Foreign Affairs, met with representatives of the Jewish life of the GDR and abroad. Oskar Fischer emphasized that GDR is an anti-fascist state in which racism, anti-Semitism and fascism have been eradicated with their roots. The East German government and the nation pay respect to the memory of the victims of Nazi barbarity, including the six million murdered Jewish citizens. Thus, the Holocaust had now become a central point in the issue of how to come to terms with the Nazi past. More attention was paid to non-communist and non-socialist Jews in German history. A massive history of anti-Semitism in Germany written by Rudolf Hirsch 
himself a Holocaust survivor and Rosemary Schuder mentioned a great number of such names. This book also paid careful attention to ordinary German perpetrators. Popular support of the Nazis was no longer belittled. A detailed history of the Kristallnacht by Kurt Petzold and Irene Runge came out on the eve of the 50th anniversary. The authors admitted that Jewish communists and social democrats suffered more than their non-Jewish comrades. Petzold and his colleague Manfred Weisbecker organized a symposium in Jena that also dealt with former Nazis, among them a few of Hitler's professors who had managed to survive as respected academics in East Germany. An illustrated publication by the Association of Jewish Communities in the GDR that was published in English asked explicitly, explicitly why the majority of Germans had remained silent, turning a blind eye to the relentless persecutions, as Sigmund Rothstein, a survivor of the pogrom and now head of the association said. Theatre companies and movie theatres were performing as usual at this day, and many people went to do their business, he said. Was it only fear of the Nazis that kept people silent? The same question was asked on a symposium at the <coughs> Academy of Sciences that also paid much attention to Jewish, including non-Jewish communist resistance against European fascism, and also to the role of capitalist German Jews as entrepreneurs and sponsors of culture. At the end of the 1980s, Historians could discuss freely the role of bu Jewish bourgeois from Gerson Bleichröder to Emil Rathenau, or to liberal writers from Paul Heise to Jakob Wassermann. Even the book From Prejudice to Destruction by the Israeli historian Jacob Katz could be published. Non-communist studies on anti-Semitism could now be read, while Paul Merkos book Deutschland sein oder nicht sein, Germany to be or not to be, that he had written in Mexican exile remained a taboo, as remained its author and his fate. The party's political infallibility had to remain uncontested. This claim for infallibility was also responsible for other limits. East Germans' official policy was never able or never willing to pay tribute to do those dissident communists who had much earlier than the Communist Party of Germany perceived the nature and deadly destructiveness of Nazi anti-Semitism. The SED and its leading propagandists never acknowledged that communist so-called deviators like Leon Trotsky, August Thalheimer or Arthur Rosenberg were able to follow the rise of Hitler with much more profound analysis than the KPD of the Weimar Republic. Communist dissidents from the KPD opposition, the Lenin Bund, or the circle around Trotsky had defended the democratic rights and institutions of the Weimar Republic despite all criticism of its clear character, while the KPD had equated fascism with a half authoritarian Brüning government and even with the Social Democratic Party. No serious research on the small but important leftist group was possible in East Germany. Also, if you write a seed <laughs> research on this. Um, it was also Trotsky, and not the KPD, who predicted right after the Kristallnacht that this was the prelude to war and the prelude to the Holocaust. In a letter to American comrades, Trotsky wrote on the 22nd of November 1938, It is possible to imagine without difficulty what awaits the Jews at the mere outbreak of the future world war. But even without war, the next development of world reaction signifies with certainty the physical extermination of the Jews. No East German publication before 1989 could make reference to this persecution, to this prediction. Thank you very much and open for question and criticism. Questions or comments? And criticism, of course. Uh, we'll hold that to the end. Please, let's go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for coming. First I need my other class that I can. Go ahead. Why do you think it was that it was more prevalent for 
in the GDR, or well, not as prevalent, actually more prevalent in the GDR for them to bring war criminals to justice? Um, look, I mean, um, different, okay, good question, different reasons. First of all, one should not forget that the political elite of the GDR, the communist elite, yeah, uh, either were survivors from exile, such as Walter Ulbricht, the head of the state in the party, or people who were uh, long-time uh, uh, prison inmates, such as his successor, Erich Honecker, yeah, who, um, who spent uh, 10 years in jail after the Nazis, yeah? and also many people, particularly from the cultural elite, had uh, returned from, uh, from, from uh, exile, such as, such as the composer Hans Eisler, the writer of Bertolt Brecht and Stefan Heim, or the economic historian Jürgen Kuczynski, and many, and, uh, many more. <coughs> yeah? uh, this was, of course, uh, this was, of course, a personal reason. Also, yeah, I mean, communism, with all its deficiencies, yeah, uh, uh, had defined itself as an anti-fascist ideology, and indeed it was, yeah, and uh, and also, um, let's say, uh, let's say, on the contrary, why the uh, why uh, former Nazis had a better life in the West than, than in the East. I mean, in the first, in the first two years, yeah, uh, after 1945, there were uh, many, many Nazis were brought, were brought to trial by the Western Allies, by the British, French, and American authorities, also in the West, yeah? And, um, but, uh, but <coughs> in the, but during the Cold War, the West, and particularly the Americans, realized, yeah? that former Nazis, particularly hardcore Nazis, with all their expertise in their anti, in their anti, in their long time anti-communist fight, yeah, we are uh, needed. That's why, for instance, the West German uh, Secret Service was completely, I mean, uh, completely without any exception, yeah, the first personnel were former people who had served for, who, who had served for Hitler, and it's had Reinhard Gehlen, uh, um, uh, who was um, who was protected by the uh, by the newly founded CIA? Yeah, was himself a war uh, a war criminal. Uh, or Werner von Braun, <coughs> who was brought um, who was who 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 built a racket uh, that that um, that attacked um, that attacked London in the Second World War. He was brought to Huntsville, Alabama, and uh, built up the the NASA the NASA uh, rocket program. The Americans realized it much more than the Soviets that these pe that these people would be obedient. Uh, Obedient tools in their in 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 their hand, and so and so Hans 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 Klopke, uh, one of the two authors of the infamous uh, Nuremberg Laws, which basically degraded uh, the Jews to to second and third class citizens. Yeah, he was later he was uh, he had become a um, vice minister under Adenauer. Also, also Adenauer had despised him, but in his hands, yeah, he was of course an obedient uh, obedient uh, tool. It must be seen. It must be seen within <coughs> the context of the Cold War, and it must be seen that the power structures, I mean those, I mean, I mean the, the politic, the economic elites, which had supported Nazism, yeah? I mean, never lost power in, uh, in, uh, West, uh, in uh, West Germany. I do not say that every capitalist was, of course, per se, uh, a supporter of the Nazis, nor do I say, nor do I say that, um, that um, that let's say uh, that big business and Nazism uh, had an alliance from the very first beginning, but I mean the the German big business had had certainly profited very much from uh, let's say uh, from the occupation of uh, of uh, of Europe and only now in the 1990s yeah and later yeah uh, some of the some of the companies could be brought to trial here 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 in America and they, and, and paid some compensation to the uh, to the to the <coughs> Jewish family from which um, uh, from from which they took their their property and even the post-war economic boom in West Germany would not have made would would not have been possible by such an extent yeah without um, without the former uh, without the former robbery of uh, you know, of all the property, not only of Jewish, but also of many, uh, let's say, um, non-Jewish people from around Europe. One must take this into account. As you were, as you were talking, I was thinking about the, how the Holocaust was manipulated yeah. according to what was current 
first among installed Russia. And yes. It, and it reminded me of, of how the Polish communists dealt with the oh. massacres at Katyn oh, in oh, 1940. Oh. oh. Maybe you'd like to... Look, I mean, um, um, I mean uh, I'm not a specialist in uh, Polish history, and, and since I'm not in Polish, I don't read the Polish, uh, Polish uh, sources. Mm. But certainly, I mean, um, I mean, um, I mean the policy, politics of memory. Yeah, <coughs> they are highly instrumentalized. Yeah, mm -hmm. by the uh, by the Stalinist regimes. Yeah, one, one has to see only that uh, it was. One can see two dimensions. On the one hand, this instrumentalize how 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 the how the regime instrumentalized politics of memory, and I think I I I think I explained it. And on the other hand. On the other hand, the anti-fascist uh, appeal. I mean, so many, so many. I mean, more. I mean, I mean, basically, the resistance against Nazism in Germany was mainly a workers' resistance. It was mainly the workers, communists, social democrats, workers without party, uh, without party affiliation, who who tried to resist, who tried to help the Jews. I mean, much earlier than, for instance, uh, than for instance, the bourgeoisie. Uh, the middle class or the or, or the agrarian upper class did, yeah. Uh, so both dimensions and and one dimension uh, cannot be seen without the with, without the other. For the for for a Stalin's politics of memory, of course, the the um, let's say the the legacy of the anti-fascist firm is used. And as I also told, and and as I, and as I also told, those anti-fascists who were uh, who were critiques of the regime from the left. We are not mentioned, or we are mentioned least. Yeah? I mean, I mean, I remember the symposium at the Academy of Sciences. Uh, of Sciences and, and by the way, it was the first time that that that, that I spoke in a. It was um, basically, basically, I had not uh, uh, I had not said in the paper before, but then I spoke on the uh, on the uh, on the resistance of the small groups, and I mentioned, and I mentioned uh, this uh, prediction of Trotsky. And a prominent historian, whom I personally quite much I don't mention the name, yeah, I mentioned him several times here in in my talk, yeah. He came to me, and he was and he was very outraged. How can you? How can you? He asked me. Uh, how can you put the? How can you put the Trotsky sectarians <coughs> on the same on the same level as the KPD? This was. I mean, I mean, uh, this sounds strange for Americans, yeah. Of course. But it was very much an issue in all communist uh, in all uh, in all communist countries. Basically, the Soviet Union. Yeah. Even so, Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev, has broken with this rule. And Khrushchev, in his famous uh, in his famous secret speech in 1955, 56, he had said, "Yes, we, the party, are guilty." Yeah. But later, it was it was always played down. And I mean, Katyn could not be. Uh, uh, could not be a crime that was committed by the Russians yeah, in in this mindset. Where, where did Trotsky publish that letter? In which American publication? Uh, it was it was uh, published only in 1970. It was a circular it was a circular letter to what was then the Socialist Workers Party, uh -huh. the Schechtmanites, if somebody oh, was oh, with them. Okay. Yeah, uh, and it was published in a it, it was published in a. In a brochure on the Jewish uh, Leon Trotsky on the Jewish question, Yeshiva has also a copy of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, Kristallnacht is often talked about as like the first real uh, wake-up call, I guess, of Germany or the world that something is bound to happen. As you're saying, Trotsky kind of saw it as this precursor. Yeah. Um, do you think that Kristallnacht, like the the event, had a difference on the outcome of what the Holocaust was, meaning you think it would have yeah. progressed differently? I think, I think yes. I think I, that's a quest, that's a core question. I think, I think the the Nazis. I mean, first of all, the Kristallna proved three proved three things. First of all, it proves that the Nazis were organized within two days. Yeah? let's say uh, an organized gigantic mass pogrom. This was one. A national and nationwide pogrom. The second thing was that, due to terror, but also due to let's say half kind of sympathy, that the population was passive. They watched it. Yeah, mm -hmm. they did not. I mean, 
I mean, of course, I, I mean, it was an all embraced terror. I mean, I never say that the majority of the Germans liked it. I, but it's simply not true. But of course, they could do it without. Uh, uh, yeah? And the second was, look, what was, it? what was the international reaction? I mean, basically, it no. was the international reaction. It was a few, it was a few weeks after <coughs> the Munich Agreement, in which basically France and Britain had agreed with Austria, uh, uh, sorry, with, 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 with uh, Italy and Germany to divide Czechoslovakia. That, that Czechoslovakia, or part of Czechoslovakia, would fall in the hand of the Germans. Yeah? Basically, what, uh, basically the, the Nazis also saw that besides, some, besides some, some protests in the press, nothing happened. And I, so, so I think this, this, uh, this, this, was, this was a key experience for them. Also in Goebbels' di also Goebbels diaries, of course, Goebbels, Goebbels, Goebbels of course, makes, makes fun of the, international, of the international press. And from his perverse standpoint, from his own standpoint, he was unfortunately very white. Yeah. Uh, sorry, the next question there. Uh, the, uh, with, with the leftist groups in both Poland and, and, and Germany, there was a distinct difference between the Marxist communists and the Stalinist communists. Oh, yes. And there was also the socialists. Okay, yes. And with Crystal Knock, the socialists and the, Sta and the Marxist co communists did a lot of publication of the material. Exactly. But because they were leftists and, and geared in, in the eyes of France, Germany, and the United States as being communists, what they said was not considered as credible. Yeah. And that, that, that broke down, and that made the allowed Nazis to say they can do anything they want. But the, the, in fact, the organization, of, uh, and the, uh, yeah. and they used small towns when they went to, into Kristallnacht, yeah. and, and, uh, and the imp impact of these people walking in, boom, and doing it so quickly, mm -hmm. everybody stood around like there was nothing going on. And my grandfather, who was this, said it was horrible. We stood there and did nothing. And we did something, and we got beat up. And so the Nazis really imprinted their, their mark on Germany at that point. They really made it work. Mm -hmm. I can, I can, I, I can only agree. Okay, I think this was, a, this was a comment on the question. I agree. Um, I, uh, in a sort of a <coughs> larger study, you, you, you drew the methodological net pretty narrow mm -hmm. um, yeah. with the newspaper and the yeah, public, I had to. public celebrations. Well, right, and that's an, a lot of material already. Mm. But where would you go next in terms of? trying to find a, a pattern. Would you go to textbooks and see what dates are mentioned and, and see what in the history books is, is being um, mm -hmm. uh, paid attention to in terms mm -hmm. of the account of yeah. uh, the time under the Nazis or what? where would yeah. be the best places to go from here? I mean, I mean uh, the best places, the best places, and this is uh, where I uh, pay much attention in, or I, or I pay much, I'm, I'm paying much attention in all the research of the last years, is of, co of course um, archival material, the exile, the exile, the exile publications, the leaflets, the diaries, the diaries of the uh, of the refugees, and until and and until recently, and I have to say it with a kind of sadness. I interviewed a lot of refugees on both sides of the of the uh, Atlantics. By the way, not less than six centenarians. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the problem is uh, with some of them. I was um, I, I had a close friendship. Yeah. The problem is none of them is uh, is, is 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 still with us. Yeah. Um, but. Um, but in uh, but in my in my publication most of it is in German but sometimes I wrote also also in English uh, here they are still with us in the maker and uh, and from this and from their recollections yeah I think that that helped that helped me a lot in my research my 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 basic my I mean my basic research over the last years they are mostly uh, left wing communist or former communist intellectual refugees yeah. In the uh, in the United States and also their return to Germany. So I wrote a number of uh, biographies, such as such as of uh, Ruth Fischer, the former leader of the German Communist Party and later a key figure in American anti-communism. Yeah, or uh, or about the political scientists um, uh, Otto Blechtheim and Richard Löwenthal, or the, I mentioned the historian Arthur uh, Rosenberg. 
who taught at Brooklyn College and whose books on the on the Weimar Republic and on the history of Bolshevism and on democracy and socialism are still very readable even uh, even today and so on and so forth and I think I mean I think if you if you do not strictly biographical research but if you um, but if you contextualize the biographical um, the biographical research and and have a look into the net in, into the, the networks which I always do yeah I mean I think that helps yeah, I sorry because I I was not here during the beginning of your lecture. Mm -hmm. I was no. teaching. Sure. I I know that your focus was on the memory and the perception yes. of Kristallnacht yes. after it happened. Yes. But uh, I I was wondering how much of the phenomenon of Kristallnacht itself was mm -hmm. studied. You see, because it's a sort of strange mm -hmm. thing. Obviously, in mm -hmm. 1938, Hitler could only affect the Jews in Germany and not the Jews elsewhere. Yeah. He was mm -hmm. he had not started. Mm -hmm his conquering in Europe. Yeah. But there was a sort of always ambivalence there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that in 1940, 1941, mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. half of the population of, all, half of yeah. the Jewry of Europe was already marked for mm -hmm. extermination, the Jewish community in Berlin was functioning. And in 1942, and I mean, half of the Jews had left, but yeah. the other half were living in certain conditions that were untouched mm, compared to yeah. what you would mm. experience if mm. you were a Jew living in Poland or in the big centers okay. of yes, Judaism. That's true. Does it say something about that, that perhaps Kristallnacht was something persecuting propaganda yeah. effects or, uh -huh. or trying to do say. something? Mm. Because it was clear that uh, Hitler mm. didn't see the German Jews the same way that he saw the, mm. the, 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 the mm. Jews mm. of Poland mm. or the Jews of Hungary or the places mm. where his objective was simply to erase the population mm -hmm. completely, mm -hmm. or something was different. But that the decision comes later. Yeah. What? That decision to yeah. uh, extermination well, comes yeah. later. But, you know, if you were a Jew in Poland in 1941, believe me, yeah. you were not be in the situation if you were a Jew yeah. in Berlin. I see what you say. When you see the Jewish community living in Berlin in 1943, you wonder, how, how is that possible? I mean, uh, uh, 40, I mean 41 years, 40, 43 was already uh, different. I mean, with the let's say the German invasion to the Soviet Union, yeah? Yeah. which as we know was the uh, basically the start of what we now call the Holocaust. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, uh, also, uh, also wasn't it abruptly the situation of the Jews, let's say in uh, Berlin. But, you, but your question is uh, fully uh, justified. Let's say the, uh, the Jüdische Kulturverein, the Jewish Cultural Association, um, existed at least on paper. It existed until 1942, uh, and the and the and the Jewish Rabbinical College uh, was not disbanded before 1941, which is also true. Yeah. And one can say what um, uh, the I mean. Um, first of all, first of all, the the Nazis always uh, they saw the German Jews as a pawn in a game, mm -hmm. as somebody who could be. Who could be traded for something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they saw. That's yeah, uh, 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 that's the main. That's the main reason. Look, I mean, the Polish Jews. I mean, basically, ninety percent of the Polish Jews were poor. What did they? What did? What did they have? This this poor people in the Städte. Yeah. But the German Jews. Well, one one could still one could still trade with them. One could. Um, yeah. So uh, so it was of course like a cat and the mouse game because yeah. I think. I think up from nineteen up from nineteen uh, forty two, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They of from course, uh, but well, another thing. Stolen art. Yeah. O okay. Look. Yeah. Yes. For instance, yeah. another thing. Another thing is Berlin. I have to say, Berlin was the least anti-Semitic uh, city in Germany. Berlin before nineteen before nineteen thirty three had an overwhelming left wing vote. Yeah. The communists finished first. The Social Democrats finished second in the in, in, in the elections, both for the city council, but also at the at, at the election to the German Parliament. Yeah, mm. this is of course something. Yeah, yeah. and then uh, it was. I mean, the Nazis knew that uh, they had to take a kind of a resistance into account, mm. which also means resistance can change things. I mean, at the Rosenstrasse, yeah, for the example. I mean the the wives, the non-Jewish wives. Of the Jewish inmates protested, and the men were not sent <coughs> to Auschwitz. Yeah? yeah, and this is 43, right? Yeah, 43. Yeah, uh, or, in, or, or let's say, or, or if Clemens von Galen, the Catholic Archbishop Bishop of Münster, 
1940, he spoke out against the, 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 T, the T4 action, against the extermination of the, of the handicapped people in Berlin. He spoke out against it and it was stopped. Yeah? That shows that shows, I mean, even under Nazism, they had to take resistance into, into account, in, in, in particularly in their own country. In Poland and in Russia, it was different because this was a total war. Mm. Yeah? And I think, this, uh, I think this is the difference. But the German Jews were doomed to be destroyed like the yeah, others. Yeah, yeah unfortunately. Yeah, okay. Funny. Yeah. But of course, I mean, yeah. yeah. It was always intriguing. Actually, I was watching Rosenstrasse preparing for the visit you of Van Trotta. I was watching. Mm -hmm. and I was saying, listen, this is 1943. So you see, and, you know, something was possible. Really Certainly, no one in Poland in 1943. Mm -hmm. No Jew in Poland could. Where was Leo Beck then? Uh, Leo, Leo Beck survived in Berlin. He in Berlin, not in any of the camps. Uh, uh, in the end, he came yeah. to Theresienstadt. In the end, but it's, but very but as far as I know, quite late. 43 or 44? Uh, Professor Kessler has to leave to Unfor give an exam. Unfortunately, you know? <laughs> Unfortunately. I, I wish I could. So I wish bad, I could you know. But my students already left and they are waiting, yeah, and they are waiting, they are for, waiting. The, for, for the midterm. That's a poor yeah. man. Oh, wow. so I think Last minute study. I, I have to, unfortunately, I have to go. Thank you very, very much for Thank coming. Thank you yeah? so, Thank so, so much. Mario. But Mario. I still have to do this for the day. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you so much.